It's always great when it's the right place and the right time. <laughs> so <coughs> we're going to look at a few of these things today. I'm going to kick off with some statistics about renovation. Um, then we'll have a look at JCT contracts and what clauses your clients might use. Uh, we'll have a look at liability, party wall, and then we'll have a look at a cost estimator, which might be quite useful for you at the end. So we'll start with some stats. Uh, these statistics are based on uh, all the projects we've underwritten over the past five or six years. Uh, a lot of project time, uh, quite a lot of works, sums insured, uh, quite a lot of existing structures, and an awful lot of party war liability. Listing. It's a big issue for us. Uh, a large proportion of what we insure is listed. Uh, we see an awful lot of late Victorian, Georgian type buildings. Um, but we also see a lot of buildings that are just in straightforward conservation areas. The point I'd perhaps make to you here is that uh, getting the sum insured right for the existing structure is critical for us. Okay? So when your clients have got existing structures and they're asking you for guidance on rebuild costs, um, we're quite happy for you to come to us and uh, to ask us for some help on that. Um, we use a very useful program called Find Maps. Do many of you use that? Findmaps.co.uk. It's a very useful website. Unless you're on it all day, every day, you won't get charged for using it. And um, what it does is give you access to, if you go to the tools section, the ground floor square footage of the property you're looking at. Um, so you don't necessarily have to go and step it all up uh, to get an idea of what the overall square footage is. We use it quite a lot in conjunction with things like Google Maps and some of the other mapping um, programs that we use in insurance. Um, so when you send something into us or a broker sends something into us, uh, we've got a really good idea of whether that sum insured is correct and if we don't think it is then uh, we'll come back to you and talk to you about it. Particularly important of course for listed buildings to make sure that that's right because your clients have a liability to reinstate those um, provided it's not a total loss and in most cases it isn't. Location wise, unsurprisingly a lot of what we do is in the south of England, uh, it's where there's a lot going on and a huge amount uh, in London as well. Uh, some really, really quite leery projects including double basements, that sort of thing, we get involved with that, uh, those types of projects quite often uh, because there aren't many underwriters who've got the appetite uh, to get involved. Thankfully, a large proportion of our clients have a joint names JCT, and we'll talk about why that's a really good thing and how the client wins. Unfortunately, 20% have no contract at all. They're running on the contractor's terms and conditions, and we'll look at how uh, that might not be great for them in the event of a loss. In the last five years, particularly, the amount of people taking out party wall insurance has increased. Uh, about 36% of our clients do, and it's our biggest source of claims by claim intimation. So we see more claim intimations, so more notifications of claim, um, than we do in any other class of business we write uh, within Party Wall. We don't pay out the most money on Party Wall. Um, the losses tend not to be huge a lot of the time. Uh, big catastrophe fire losses and water losses are the ones that really cost us a fortune. Um, but in terms of claims investigation costs, uh, Party Wall insurance uh, really accounts for the majority of our claims investigation costs, I'd say, on our book. Two interesting ones here, time and money. So uh, about 90% uh, go over schedule and an even higher percentage go over budget. Um, anybody got any ideas why that sort of thing happens, particularly in private client land? Budget probably changes the client spec. Sometimes. Exactly. Quite often clients change their mind as projects are going on. Um, in terms of time, could be something to do with weather, could be something to do with materials. Quite often it's to do, in terms of budgets, to do with the specification. So an initial specification would have been put forward with provisional sums for things like kitchens, bathrooms and that sort of thing. And then the client comes back and says, actually, I'd rather like small bones to do it or somebody like that. So instead of 50,000, it's 150,000. Whilst we're talking about budget, um, quite often clients get a little bit confused about what the actual budget is for their project. And quite often they'll tell their broker, well, my contract says 400,000. In terms of a sum insured, that's probably not the right amount, and we'll just talk briefly about that. So 
if a client's got a project that's 400k, um, what other things might they have forgotten to add into that? VAT. Fees. Fees, yeah. So let's say um, you're all working on a shoestring and that's 10%. Uh, anything else? Provisional sums. Okay, let's say there's 10% in there for that. Contingencies, yep, that's probably within there. Statutory costs. Uh, statutory costs are usually picked up as part of the policy anyway. Um, but sometimes the clients provide or their own um, materials or partially their own materials will use a single <coughs> subcontractor to do a specific part of the project. So let's say um, this single contractor has got... Yep, yeah, that's the killer. So actually what they've spent getting here is 520k and then when you add VAT to that, um, that is another 120 odd, isn't it? So actually some insured for that project is not 400k, it's 620k, all right? So they could be a good third underinsured. So just try and coach clients when they're buying this type of cover to allow more time and to actually be realistic about what they've spent. These are the trends we see in renovation over the past five years. The average works cost is in grey and the average existing structure in gold. What you can see is that actually those are converging. All right? So more and more people are spending more and more money as a ratio of their works to existing structure than ever before. Okay? Any idea what's prompting that? Stamp duty. You are bang on. Yeah. Absolutely bang on. Yeah. Stamp duty means that people who are actually in the right location, who have the ability to change the property they've got into the property they want, are doing that rather than moving. Mm -hmm. And you know, if you take the average price for private client land of say 1.3 million for a property, stamp duty is about 70k. When you add all the other costs in there as well, it's probably 100k to move, and that's dead money. That's an awful lot of money that you can start to pump prime uh, a really nice renovation project. This one's always a good laugh. So uh, this is the average amount of time that clients tell us their projects will run. About eight months or just under. When I factor in the extensions that we make to those policies, where do you think it actually sits? There you go, just over 12. So actually, again, clients are better placed if they can assume that it's going to take slightly longer than they think or their contractors um, promised it's going to. Um, and there's a really good reason for that. Insurers don't like hanging on at the end of projects and consistently extending the insurance cover. The reason they don't like doing that is because most large losses occur from the midsection to the end of a contract. Okay? All those expensive things are going in. There's things like application of heat for plumbing and that sort of thing going on as well. And so all of our large losses tend to occur within that period. So the more you'll seem to be extending it at the end, the less an insurer likes it. And what they'll do after a first meaningful extension of three months, which they'll give at a pro rata rate, um, is they'll probably start loading it. And it could be anything up to 30%. Okay? So actually, if you make some decent assumptions at the outset, you'd be saving your clients a bit of money. Okay. Let's have a look at JCT. Um, who gets involved in actually writing up JCT contracts for their clients? Is there anybody here? One, two, three. perfect, okay. So we'll have a look at a little bit of the history of JCT and the versions of it, which one you might choose for which type of project and which insurance clauses to use, what it says about liability and how it protects the employer. So. JCT has been around a long time. Um, it's a collaborative contract, and the latest edition we've got is 2016. Everybody gets together every few years just to check whether what's happening in case law and <coughs> actually on the ground in um, the world of construction uh, makes the JCT that's uh, being used relevant. We see 
Um, some people getting confused about who's who, uh, particularly insurance brokers, so the employer obviously is their policyholder, uh, and the contractor's the main contractor and anybody working under him. So the versions we see used most often are the minor works, intermediate and standard form. We don't encourage anybody to use the homeowner contract because it hardly mentions insurance and actually, from our perspective, isn't worth the paper it's written on. Okay? These are the sort of contract values that we expect to see within those three contracts. Okay? Uh, I can remember the first one I ever wrote years ago was a £5 million contract in Mayfair, uh, which was a facade retention, and it had been written on a minor works JCT. Wholly inappropriate for what was going on. So let's have a look uh, at these in a little bit more detail. The minor works has three clauses or three choices for insurance. Usually 5.4a and 5.4c are used together. Okay? That's insurance of the works by the contractor in joint names and insurance of the existing structure by the employer. Now, the reason this is done is that traditionally insurers actually didn't want to give joint names cover on the existing structure. Any idea why? It's to do with subrogation. Okay? So normally the person who burns the place down is the contractor or one of their subcontractors and if they're joint insured, they're both first party to the insurance, then the insurers can't actually subrogate against them. In turn, what that means is that the insurers can't claim on their reinsurance, so if it's a particularly large property, so the likes of Hiscox retain perhaps five million themselves, Royal Sun Alliance probably two million. If you've got an existing structure that's 10 million, then if they give joint names cover, they're on for the whole 10, okay? Not just their two and five respectively. And you can imagine how unpopular an underwriter might be if he'd made the decision to give away joint names cover uh, and then a loss like that occurs. It goes straight on their bottom line. The downside of writing A and C is that not many contractors bother to ring up their insurers and say, can you put this in the joint names of uh, me and the employer? Okay, less than 5%. So what you end up with is the works insured on a solus basis in respect to the contractor. Okay, we'll look at that a bit more in a minute. Um, 5.4C for the uh, client, for the employer, means normally that the insurers will restrict the cover down, perhaps to fire only, okay, during the works. And for somebody who's been used to, being, used to buying an all risks insurance, that doesn't seem great, really. Usually the price goes up, the excess goes up. There might even be an exclusion, total exclusion, if it's an unoccupied property, for contractor damage uh, per se. Okay? So, the best way to insure this, if you can, is for the employer to do it. Okay? In the joint names of uh, them and the contractor. And in a minute, we'll find out why. So, let's look at a private client project. We've got, um, I put these as equal stage payments, we all know that it probably goes something like that towards the end when all the valuable stuff goes in. But um, those are the stage payments in black. The existing structure, some insured, stays linear throughout the project. Okay? And then this is probably what the client's hoping for in terms of market value. Okay? As insurance brokers, market value is not really <coughs> relevant to us but it's an enormous part of the emotional journey for the client, okay? And it's what they're borrowing money against, okay? So it really is very relevant. So the client's expecting for the project to complete, and then they'll give us a ring or their broker a ring and say, actually, some insured needs, to go, needs now to go up to uh, two million, and my property's worth three and a half million happy days, okay? Let's have a look at it when it doesn't go quite right. So the client in this instance has made it to the third quarter. Just after the third quarter, and they've made their stage payments, there's a loss. Okay, there's a fire, the works are damaged, um, and the existing structure, as you can see now, isn't at the same rebuild cost, and look what's happened to the value. The value's come right down. If at this point, the contractor has committed what's called a vitiating act. 
So they have broken the terms of their CAR policy and their insurers have declined to pay, then your client is in a position where he's got to refinance that 600,000. So they've lost that. Okay. They can sue the contractor, but most contractors don't hold a lot of money in their business, so likely it is they'll go into liquidation. Um, and he's got an existing structure that he may or may not have the insurance cover to rebuild. Okay. <coughs> if he's borrowed a significant amount of money to do the project, his loan to value there is completely shot to pieces. And what we've seen before is people basically end up with a derelict building post-loss and a building plot to sell because they cannot refinance and they're not insured. Okay? So it's counterintuitive to actually give away the responsibility of the insurance of what is for most people their single largest <coughs> asset um, to somebody else who doesn't really understand insurance or to try and split it up in a way that really doesn't provide them with the same cover as they used to having before. So in this instance, this client's ended up with a net loss of 2.6 million as they see it from the 3.5 they were probably going to be running with. Okay, not a great position. Let's have a look at the intermediate and standard form. Here it's a lot easier. So you've got three options, A, B and C, 6.7, A, B and C. Um, in most new build situations, it'll be specified that it's insured in the joint names by the contractor. Again, not many contractors bother to actually get the policy placed in the joint names. Better, if it's a new build, for the client to insure on an all-risk basis in the joint names. Any idea why? Okay, two things quite often happen. One, the contractor goes bust, and at the point they go bust, the JCT fails, and his obligation to insure fails with it, and his insurance, as soon as he goes into liquidation, ceases. Or the client gets frustrated with the contractor, sacks them, and then again, their obligations under the JCT cease. In either of those situations, the client's then left with a building that's half finished, and trying to get a half finished building insured as an existing structure is incredibly difficult. Okay? So far better that they stay in control of that. The existing structure situation is a lot easier. Uh, there is only one option, 6.7c. Um, try to discourage property lawyers from messing around with the insurance clauses in the JCT. They actually work really, really well. So um, quite often when clients send us their sample contracts, uh, we're asking the lawyers to unravel some of the really intelligent changes they think they've made. Um, so that the client can benefit from the standard clauses. So 6.7c, where, the, where it's intermediate or standard form uh, and there's any sort of existing structure. So, why joint names? It puts the client in control, puts the employer in control. That's really important. Why would you give away that responsibility to somebody else? You know the premium's paid. That's really important as well. A lot of contractors are quite slow to pay their insurance premium or if they have an interruption in their cash flow and they're um, paying by direct debit, then there could be issues with cover there. Most importantly, in this type of policy, there's something called a non-vitiation clause. Okay? It's a little technical piece of insurance wizardry, but what it really means is that where you've got two parties who are first party to the insurance contract, if the other one breaks the terms of the insurance, it doesn't preclude the other party from being paid. So in this situation, if the contractor ignores the heat warranties on the insurance policy, burns the house down, the employer is still going to get paid. Okay? And that is really important. If you've just got something like an indemnity to principles clause, um, which is designed to note the interest of a principal, in this case the employer in a policy, it doesn't actually confer those non-vitiation rights to them. Okay? So it's really, really important. And there's no chasing the contractor for the stage payments. It seems odd to me that when a client's making stage payments and their insurable interest is increasing all the time during the contract, that the contractor is actually insuring the works when their insurable interest goes down to zero every time the stage payment's made. Okay? So, stay in control of that. 
it complies with their mortgage terms. So as I said, if they're borrowing money, um, nobody bothers to read their mortgage contract or the uh, loan agreement that they've got for the works they're undertaking. But there'll be minimum insurance provisions within that. Okay, they won't necessarily be all risks, they'll be foreign perils, but they'll always include subsidence. And we're the only people in the market who give subsidence cover on buildings undergoing renovation. We'll even give subs cover on uh, buildings that have existing subsidence issues. Uh, those subsidence issues quite often are part, part and parcel of the works. Um, and if there are parts of the property that are unaffected, then we may extend the policy cover subject to a higher access to do that. It decouples the contractor's, contractor's all risk policy. And again, it's a slightly technical insurance bit, but <clears throat> the worst situation for a client to get into is for, uh, for them to say, actually, I'm not really that happy with what the contractor's offering. You know, we've got no contract with him. I don't know who his insurers are. So actually, I'm going to buy some contractor's all risk myself, a separate policy and then I'm going to have a fire lightning aircraft policy uh, for my existing structure and the contractor can do what he likes. What you could end up with is three insurance policies running at once, okay? One for the contractor, one for the client on the works, in which case you've got two loss adjusters squabbling about who's going to pay for what, and then you've got the existing structure insurers and their loss adjusters saying, well, what's works, what's structures? You know, actually, works claims are really complicated to sort out. Uh, and what you don't want is uh, that number of um, adjusters squabbling about what they're doing. Most insurance brokers understand what's going on uh, with an insurance policy. The sort they deal with with their client every day, okay? It's the basis of their relationship. When you introduce a JCT into that, this becomes the primary policy and this becomes the <coughs> secondary. So what we're trying to do is to actually carve as much advantage as we can out of the JCT for the client, okay? Rather than just think about foisting cost back onto the contractor, because actually that's not always a sensible thing to do. And I find construction lawyers think that by trying to force the insurance responsibility back onto the contractor, they're saving their client a fortune. Well, actually, the client's going to end up paying for it anyway, so they might as well have it right. Okay, it may as well be in their name. Okay. So we end up with no dual insurance, which is something you definitely don't want. The other benefit of this is that <coughs> it's all risk cover for the structure and the works. So you remember what I was talking about in terms of the existing structure being covered for fire lightning aircraft risks only and the works being covered against all risks. I'll give you a good, a good example of where that could have gone very wrong for a client. Um, we had, I think it was a £6 million contract and £4 million in existing structure, again in central London. Um, the project is nearing practical completion. Thames Water have put in a new two-inch main into the property. Plumbing contractors have um, coupled up to it without pressure testing their pipe work properly. It blows and that's running for 12 or 14 hours um, before anybody discovers it. So the basement conversion that they've done, they've lowered the ground floor and put a sub-basement in. That's now a swimming pool, okay? Um, all of the M&E that comes back into a plant room that's controlled by Cat5 cabling, <coughs> 14 kilometres of it, okay? The bottom ends of that gets wet. The contractor won't warrant the bandwidth, so we've got to rip <coughs> out all of that cabling, all the finishes, everything else, and replace all of it because we can't re-terminate it higher up. Um, in that situation, if the client had only had fire cover on the property, the damage to the existing structure by the water wouldn't have been covered. Also, that client is renting a property <coughs> just up the street at £15,000 a week. Okay? There's, a, again, a, a slightly technical insurance piece that says if an insured event hasn't occurred, then the cover for things like alternative accommodation won't work either. Okay, so if the loss wasn't due to fire, there's no alternative accommodation cover. We paid out 225,000 in alternative accommodation. This loss uh, came in all to 874,000. Okay, so all risk cover for the works and the structure is a really great thing because it doesn't really matter then what existing structure is or 
uh, what the works are, the insurers are going to end up paying for it. <coughs> and this last point is, again, central. What you really want is a single insurer, a single access, and a single adjuster. Okay? All they're focused on <coughs> is getting this property back to where it was as quickly as they can. Okay? And that's really important, because when insurers actually start um, trying to dispute things with each other, that introduces so much delay. Really, the client's not interested in that. All they want is their property put back, okay? And their project back on track, okay? So, actually, if you can keep it really nice and simple, use the JCT clauses in the way they're intended, then actually it will serve your client so much better. Everybody okay with JCT and the clauses? Yeah? Okay, we move on. Let's have a chat about liability. I'm always amazed that um, some people feel that it's as easy to make a claim under a liability policy as it is a first party property policy. Okay? For a liability um, claim to be paid, there has to be negligence, and that's got to be proved. Okay? That can take an awfully long time. And so we'll just have a look at this in a bit more detail. So, Basically, the JCC says the contractor will indemni indemnify the employer against these things. Okay. This is useful because it contracts the employer out of third-party claims for employer's liability, so uh, employees of the contractor, public liability uh, for people coming onto site who are not employed by the contractor, third-party property claims, potentially a transfer of party wall liability, though that's not a perfect solution. And it enables subrogation, so it's useful for us as insurers to be able to uh, fall back on the contractor's liability policy. <coughs> the contractor's liability cover needs to have sufficient limits for all of those things. When you're actually pulling together a contract for a client and you're looking at tenders, how many of you actually uh, vet the insurance that the contractor's putting forward? You do? Good? Okay. You got to. You have, absolutely right. Um, but a lot of uh, contracts we see let, um, <coughs> the vetting of the contractor's insurance is more or less a tick box exercise, and it actually needs to be a bit more than that. You need to consider the location, so where the works are going on, is it in central London with a £10 million property either side, or is it a small vicarage in a six-acre plot that if somebody blew it up wouldn't actually have any effect on anybody else? Think about the exposure. What's going on? What are the works about? Is it an internal refurb and a re-roof, or is it massive structural works like we often see, things like facade retentions, basements, that sort of stuff? Think about the project type, so who's managing the project, because that's pretty key in terms of the liability cover that's required. And think about the insurer that the contractor is using. Okay? If they're using a B or C rated insurer because they're cheap, out of nowhere, you know, Gibraltar or somewhere like that, then perhaps there's a really good reason why they're cheap. Actually, when a liability claim comes <coughs> in, what are the chances of them paying before they get to the core steps? Probably not huge. You know, if the contractor's insured with somebody like Zurich, AXA, uh, Royal Sun Alliance, Allianz, you know, big construction markets with A-rated insurers, then the chances are they stand uh, a much greater uh, opportunity of actually making a recovery. But if they're with one of these um, backstreet insurers, they probably don't. I had two uh, brothers one was an artist and the other one a so say property developer <coughs> who were uh, uh, redeveloping a four-storey townhouse in the east end of London. The so say property developer went off to Australia uh, and left his brother to finish off the project. He got on site and said to the contractor, what about insurance? And he said, well, I think your brother sorted that out. So he rang his brother and his brother said, well, I think the contractor sorted that out. And between them, they hadn't got a bean. So there was no public liability, employer's liability, there was no party wall cover and they were uh, dropping uh, a lower ground floor and underpinning the party wall. Uh, no cover for the structure and no cover for the works. 
So we said to the guy, I think you better stop just for now, because the work sequencing looked all over the place. And I don't think this guy had ever been a main contractor before. And so we sent him off to a couple of good construction markets, good brokers, to go and get some proper insurance. He came back with a per capita policy which he bought over the internet with a £2 million indemnity limit which clearly wasn't enough for this type of project but it had all of these exclusions on it. So they've got guys on scaffolding to 15 metres, there are people brazing up pipes, they're underpinning the party wall. It wasn't worth the paper it was written on. It was absolute and utter rubbish. Okay. So what we ended up doing was advising the client to employ a project manager that we would approve, which he did, and he effectively self-managed the works on behalf of, um, of the artist and saw them through. Thank God he did. I mean, actually, I dread to think what would have happened there if that had gone wrong. Okay? The point I'm making here, though, is just because a contractor has got insurance doesn't actually mean that it covers everything that is going on uh, on the project. Okay? And you could have a contractor who the best will in the world has got a limit of 250,000 perhaps, lands a big fish for a million, hasn't thought to increase their CIR limits, <coughs> hasn't thought to think, well, what are my subcontractors doing? Are they applying heat? I'm getting someone in to do some underpinning because we don't do that. You know, there are a number of things that can go wrong. So always ask to have a look at the schedule as well as the policy document to find out what the insurance is actually covering. We see principally three project types. So <clears throat> self-managed projects, quite often clients that have got some experience, so they might be property developers, they might be serial renovators, we all know a few of those, although it happens less now um, given what's happened with stamp duty. They're usually advised by an architect or a project <coughs> manager. Um, there's a scope of works and a time scale, and that's really important. The sort of thing that insurers hate is open-ended projects that may get finished sometime in the next four years, and they're spending £200,000. Not great from an insurance perspective. Um, the client <coughs> becomes the site controller, um, which might be important for things like CDM, and they could be a possible employer. So if they are employing any labour-only subcontractors, so those are guys um, using only simple tools who don't supply any materials, usually they're not that registered, pay on, paid on a day or week rate, and may only have a simple sort of insurance policy, something like a £50 a year tradesman policy or something like that. If they're employing those people, then there's a fair chance that there's a master-servant relationship there, and they need employer's liability, even though, for the purposes of taxation, they're viewed as being self-employed. Okay, or working under the, uh, was it the CIS scheme? So, um, if, you're in, if you are in any doubt, just follow the money. And if the client's playing these people direct, then actually they could be an employer. What you can guarantee is if one of those people falls off a scaffold and badly hurts themselves, the chances of them having a decent personal accident policy to take care of themselves for the 12 or 14 weeks whilst they're laid up with a broken leg is pretty small they'll be straight down to a no-win, no-fee solicitor, okay? And your client will be the biggest target. Somebody retains a project manager, actually, other than the client's perhaps having little time or experience, it looks exactly the same, okay? So the fact that there's a project manager on site doesn't alter the relationship between the client and the people working on site. He's just helping the client um, manage the project. The best contracts from our perspective are ones that are fully let, so they're likely to be JCT. There's a decent Gantt chart showing what's going to happen and when. Um, the contractor becomes the site controller, uh, and I think it's under derogation 7 in the CDM regulations. Uh, they actually um, have the CDM foisted onto the contractor, uh, which is great, and notification as well. I think notification's 400 man days, is that right? Uh, for notification of a project. Well, that isn't a very big project. You know, that's five months with half a dozen men on site. You know, there are lots and lots of projects that require notification. It's not about the building anymore. Have any of you done much around CDM regulations? Um, yeah, okay. So you'll, you'll be aware 
that the original interpretation of CDM was if it was a residential contract, it didn't apply. Mm. Whereas actually that's entirely wrong. It's nothing to do with what the building is, it's to do with who the client is, whether they're a residential client uh, or whether they're, um, I can't remember the phrase now, what do they call them? A, um, a commercial client, let's call them a commercial client. Okay, so uh, your client really doesn't want to get bound up too much in CDM if they can avoid it. The contractor takes care of CDM and the contractor manage all, manages all of the relationships with the labour only subcontractors and the bona fide subcontractors. So, in terms of the liability cover that clients need, this is what it looks like. Because in these relationships there usually isn't any JCT, the client's going to need full project public liability in the same way as a builder or contractor themselves would. Okay? They've potentially got an employer's liability exposure as well, which we've talked about. Only in a situation where the project's fully contracted does the client require simple property owner's liability. Okay? And although JCT voice all of that liability onto the contractor, the reason we always provide that is that it's a fallback position, a contingent position, if the contractor's public liability fails. Quite often, clients are named as joint respondents when somebody's hurt on site, okay, and somebody's got to get the fees, pay the fees to actually push that towards the contractor's insurers. Has anybody got any idea of what the average fees involved are for small personal injury claims? Things like broken legs, broken arms, that sort of thing, if you were to fund them yourselves, just the fee element of it. The average is 22,000, okay? Just to get it settled. And then you've got the settlement on top of that. So actually, buying property owner's liability cover is a really intelligent thing to do, and that's why we always provide it. It may be that there's a defect in the property that the contractor's not negligent for. And again, as we know, if they're not negligent, then their insurers are not going to pay. So, you always want some form of liability cover, whether that's full project or property owner's liability. Everybody okay with liability? Yeah? Good. We'll have a quick chat about party awards. Does anybody get involved in party war awards? Yeah. You do? Okay, great. So, we'll just have a, a quick run through this. I won't... Um, I won't keep you too long with it. But there are some key misconceptions about party wall insurance, and I just want to point those out to you. Uh, did anybody see this in the paper, Evening Standard? This <coughs> happened in West London. Is that Bath? Yeah, it is, yeah. It was, uh, I think, the singer Duffy's house, I think. And um, obviously, some fair structural work's about to go on, but uh, in the intervening period, whilst they're stripping out and taking some walls down, this has occurred. It's amazing the number of people who don't bother having a structural survey when they're going to undertake a lot of structural works uh, to the existing structure. Um, I think we're, we're getting into a time now where a lot of these structures have been messed around with two or three times before. And actually, there's no guarantee that the work was done that was done originally was done very well at all. Okay? So actually, if clients are uh, really excited about changing their Victorian or Georgian building into something with nice big modern uh, open spaces in it rather than lots of formal rooms, perhaps a good idea to get a uh, full structural survey before they start doing that. So, although it came into force in 1997, uh, really we haven't seen much coming through in terms of party wall cover requests really until probably 2007. So the advent of the internet, the advent of people finding out what their rights are and that sort of thing more easily has brought this to the fore. <coughs> uh, applies in England and Wales only, although Scottish law conveys similar rights and uh, we provide non-negligent cover or party wall cover uh, north of the border as well. It's an enabling act, so actually uh, it provides rights for both the people doing the work uh, and their neighbours. There's a fair bit of confusion about what a party wall is, so it could be anything up to six metres away from the neighbouring property, dependent on the depth of the works going on. Everybody usually expects it to look a little bit like that. It could just be a bearing beam or something like that for a smaller structure.
The Act also talks about party structures, so increasingly we're seeing projects going on in leasehold flats, and increasingly, particularly in central London again, um, a lot of structural work going on to open those out, particularly where clients are in control of two or three floors of um, five-storey premises. So the Act applies above and below as well as from side to side. Could just be a boundary wall. So these are the owner's rights, obviously dependent on the work. The ones we see uh, most often are that and that, uh, and those are the ones that usually are the subject of insurance. So what the owner's got to do is inform all the adjoining owners, provide temporary protection for adjacent buildings, which doesn't always happen, but this strict liability occurs. So they've got to make good damage or settle with cash. Okay? There aren't many acts in the UK where there's strict liability. Employer's liability is another one. Okay? But um, when we talked about the JCT earlier, we talked about um, a pass-through, if you like. So, so we've got the client um, and we've got all the third party liabilities down here under the Party War Act. Okay. The JCT seeks to divert that by the contractor. Okay. But if for any reason this fails at any point, this liability will still be there. Okay. Whether it's the contractor's liability insurers, their non-neg insurers, or the contractor themselves who fails. Okay. So we'll just, just keep thinking about that for a minute. What they mustn't do is start without telling anyone or <coughs> do what the Act says uh, as causing any unnecessary inconvenience, which is things like working at night and weekends and that sort of thing. So um, we talked about uh, looking after uh, an adjacent structure. This is just a short video uh, of one in Philadelphia where that hasn't <coughs> happened. You see quite often in, um, in London now big structures going up next to uh, older ones and there being a lot of structural support as well as felt and battening for the party walls. Uh, obviously this didn't occur when they were demolishing the neighbouring property. We actually provide accidental damage covered by the contractor. So if a contractor managed to do something like that or something that happened in uh, West London as we looked at earlier, we would have picked that up. Some party wall covers also include cover for the um, existing structure as well as for damage to neighbouring property. Okay, But they're few and far between. Anything that's Lloyds based won't generally. Anything that's general insurance market probably will. So. Who's the enjoying owner, whether the freeholder, the leaseholder, or any longer term tenants? I think the Act says anybody who's got an interest of more than 12 months. And when you notify them, you've got to tell them who you are, where the works are happening, what the works are, and when you propose to start. You're supposed to give at least two months notice before the start of the works, and the works usually start within a year. That is flexible, but most people default to a year. Um, so the party wall surveyor turns up, um, if uh, your clients and their uh, neighbours are smart, they'll realise that the party wall surveyor um, actually has to act impartially uh, within the Act, and so they won't bother employing any others, uh, and they'll actually get the arrangement done uh, between all of them using just one uh, to come up with the award. So what's the insurance angle here? The Party will surveyor will usually undertake a schedule of condition for the existing structure and for the neighbouring property. That's really, really important from an insurance perspective because it gives us a starting point for claims. Okay? Without that, 
we've got to actually say, well, what was the condition of the property beforehand? And how can you prove, if it's a neighbour, um, that the existing structure has been damaged? So the Party Wall Act makes the employer liable for damage, but the JCT, as we've talked about here, um, makes the contractor liable to the employer for all damage to property. So, who pays for damage? If negligence is clear, who pays, do you think? Contractor. Contractor, absolutely mm -hmm. right. If negligence isn't clear, though, who pays then? Client. The client, absolutely. And that's what non-negligent insurance mm -hmm. is there for. Okay. Can I just, on that issue, you said it's clear. I mean, the Act actually states the building owner is liable. That's right. So it is the building owner, but obviously he would have the course against the contractor. Correct. Yeah. Yep. So, so in the normal course of events, I'll give you an example. So if you look at this one here, for example, yeah. um, in this example, who pays there? Contractor. Yeah, the contractor's insurance yeah. generally will be the first standpoint or the first port of call for this type of damage. Okay. Generally speaking, provided it's not too severe, most contractors just get on and put it right anyway because yeah. they know they're going to be liable. Yeah. And they've probably got a large excess. Would an insurer pay the contractor in a case like that? Yes. Yes, they would. Yeah. But surely it's just a case of the contractor not doing his job properly. Or exactly. So that the, the client intimates a claim against the contractor, yeah. says, I've got a liability um, under the Act, but you've also damaged my property, so actually I'm going to sue you. Um, the contractor intimates a claim to his insurers. His insurers say, clearly, we're negligent here. Yep, we'll pay. That's how that works. In this situation, though, things might be slightly different. So the contractor removes a load-bearing wall and causes a collapse in the existing structure and damage to the neighbouring property. Who pays? Depends on negligence, isn't it? Exactly. It depends. It, exactly. It depends <coughs> on who's actually responsible for the loss. And in certain situations, let's say the existing structure has some defects in it that nobody could reasonably have known about. There's a change in the ground conditions that have caused the structure to become unstable. Okay. The structural engineer has done their job, provided a decent set of drawings and calculations. The contractors actually carried those out pretty well. Okay. But still, something has gone wrong. Okay. And at that point, negligence isn't going to be proved. And that's when non-negligent insurance cuts in. <coughs> so, what's covered? There are these six heads of cover. All right. Okay. So, non-negligent insurance isn't a panacea, it's not a perfect solution, but it's as close as we can get to one. Okay? It's not a property insurance, it's a sort of, if you'll forgive the expression, a bastardised liability insurance. Okay? So when someone chooses a limit for non-negligent insurance, the insurance, as, in, as with any other liability cover, will pay up to that limit and no more. Okay? There's no under-insurance. But after that limit is breached, then the person who's bought the policy is deemed to be their own insurer thereafter. Okay, so make sure when you're setting the sums insured for um, a non-negligent policy that it takes account of the rebuild of the existing structure and the possible damage that could occur to the neighbouring structure. <coughs> okay, really important. More importantly though, um, it's probably easier to understand uh, what the exclusions are here, what's not covered. So negligence by the contractor is not covered because that would be their public liability policy, which we've talked about a few minutes ago. Errors or omissions in the design of the works, and those could be architectural or they could be um, a structural engineer. Where most um, insurance policies um, are avoided by underwriters in non-neg is in this area here. Damage that could reasonably be foreseen to be inevitable, given the nature of the works and the way they're carried out. And I'll give you an example of that. So if I've got three townhouses, each of which have got a lower ground floor, and the centre uh, client 
wants to lower that lower ground floor, quite often these are only sort of six feet, seven feet in height, and they'd rather they were nine. So this is going to require some underpinning along here. Okay. If the choice of underpinning is sequential hit and miss, does everybody understand what I mean by that? Mm -hmm. Yeah? No? No. Okay, fine. So if we look at it in profile, we turn that around. So if the underpinning that's going on um, is restricted to 1.2 metre bays, that's usually the maximum specified by insurers at any one time, okay? Non um, sequential hit and miss sounds terrible, but it's in fact great, because you're not removing from the party wall large swathes of support at any one time, so the opportunity for structural failure is low. Um, in that situation, then the likelihood is you will be able to buy some non-negligent cover and an insurer won't be able to avoid the claim, okay? Because it's been done in a nice and gentle way that everyone understands. If the structural engineer says, well, actually, we're going to smash in some sheet piles there or we're going to use a more aggressive method of underpinning, then the chances of there being vibration up and down the party wall are significantly increased, okay? As is the opportunity for damage. So much so, in fact, that it could be viewed to be inevitable um, in relation to the way it's been carried out, okay? So if you've got clients who are considering a very aggressive form of underpinning um, or structural support, then really they ought to be making contingency within the contract to actually meet the costs of repairs to theirs and the neighbouring structure because it's unlikely that a non-negligent policy will pay. It doesn't mean you can't buy the cover and in certain situations insurers may provide the cover for an increased premium or for a higher excess, a combination of the two, um, and they may ins might insist on some monitoring, for example. We get that quite a lot in things like facade retentions. Okay? But um, if the insurers turn around and say, actually, we're not very comfortable with this, and I don't think we're going to be able to offer cover, you know it's falling within this area, and actually the client needs to make some provision within the contract. damage that's not under the six heads of cover, and that's usually decor um, and damage that falls within the policy excess. So increasingly, uh, we're seeing uh, escrow methods used. Anybody coming across that? Yep, okay. So those escrows normally um, are, as a minimum, the insurance excess, okay. Quite often can be quite substantial sums, with things like facade retentions and basement works, it's not unusual to see excesses of 15 to 50,000. Um, some clients who are particularly well capitalised might choose to um, actually take a much larger deductible themselves. Um, and that stays uh, with whoever it's vested with, usually within the um, gift of the party wall surveyor uh, until the works are complete. Um, if there is no damage or there's a successful insurance claim made and not all of that money is used, then it can be returned to the client at the end of the project. Does anybody, be, anybody see sort of unreasonable demands for um, escrows being made? Quite large sums of money yeah. in relation to the contract? Yeah. yeah, okay. Where generally are you going with that? Well, I mean, it's not generally with basement work, so I mean, if you're asking £50,000, £100,000, it's... Um, okay. No, no, they absolutely. They think it's a number that, well, 100,000. And is that regardless of whether the contractor or the client buy insurance or not? Uh, yeah. Really? Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't know whether any of you saw this a um, little while ago. This is from North East London. A very sad situation. So we've got uh, a pair of leaseholders um, who <coughs> own a company that owns the freehold, 50% each, nothing unusual about that. Uh, the couple on the ground floor had an expanding family, so they wanted to do a basement conversion, um, which they duly did. There was a change in ground conditions uh, shortly after that was finished, and you can see what happened. 
the gable end's completely fallen out of the property, it's split away from its sibling, and um, it's all a bit of a mess. If you actually go to the website and have a look at some of the other photographs uh, that were there, it sort of gets worse. A dangerous stru structures notice was issued, so they weren't able to go back in and recover any of their contents either, <coughs> and um, so they, they lost everything. <coughs> When it occurred, they went back to the contractor, who went back to his insurers, and found out that he'd ticked the box that said he was a painter and decorator. So his insurance, although it was inexpensive for him, wasn't actually <coughs> for basement conversions. So they sued the contractor, he went into liquidation. They approached their own home insurers, um, and because it's defective workmanship, it's not insured, it never is. So actually, what they ended up with was losing all of their equity. I think she was a professional, either an accountant or a solicitor, and didn't want to uh, go bankrupt. So they ended up, as a young couple, 200,000 down. Okay, after all of their equity had expired, they cleared the site and sold the building uh, plot and uh, settled with the other freeholder. What caused the ground to move? Um, I think it was after an extended period of rain something had softened there, obviously there wasn't any drain, proper drainage <coughs> around there, and, um, and the wall just gave way. That went in and it fell out. But that happened after the work had been completed? Yeah, just after the work had been completed. Um, there are, as you're probably aware, latent defects policies you can uh, buy to pick up uh, these sort of structural, uh, big structural projects. Um, make sure that those are instigated at the outset of the works, not at the end. Really important, a lot of the insurers will want to see the work that's going on at the time. They perhaps want to send their own surveyors out two or three times during the works, okay? And if you try and buy it post the event, it'll probably, one, be hugely expensive, and two, uh, come with lots of caveats in it as well, okay? How many of you, when you're specifying um, JCT contracts, look for a warranty by the contractor of, what is it, 10 years under contract and 12 years under deed, I think. You, you do look for those, that sort of certainty. Okay. That's great, but what we find, particularly on larger projects in London, is a lot of contractors are using single-use companies. So they'll use them for the big contract they're doing and then liquidate them afterwards, and a lot of the lawyers are not bright enough to actually look behind that and say, actually, we want the guarantee from the parent company not from the company that you've just started for this project. Okay, so just be aware of that, and if you think that might be happening, then insist on a latent defects insurance backed warranty rather than, um, rather than one just provided by the builder. Um, the best people in the market are BLP for that, who are Allianz backed. Um, they're quite fussy about what they will underwrite, but when they do underwrite it, they do it extremely well. The rest of the uh, latent defects providers, it's a bit like the Wild West. You really need to read the policy wording very carefully and look at their security as well. Could you, could you just tell me again why the domestic insurance didn't go that? Be because it's defective workmanship. Right. Okay. Had that been caused by uh, subsidence, for example... Well, well, you mentioned something about the ground conditions changing. Yeah, it, it was after a period of heavy rain and um, you know, it wasn't subsidence, it wasn't heave or anything like that. It, right. The wall just wasn't built properly, and the weight of the earth on the other side just pushed it straight in, and then the wall collapsed and fell out. Would 2.1.2 insurance have covered that? Non-neg wouldn't have covered that because the works were over, okay? Um, which is why it's so important to pet the contractor's insurance to make sure that uh, they've actually got it right. These people didn't actually go through building regs or anything else. So they did it all on the cheap and paid the ultimate price for it. I think that makes a difference. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. In that particular instance, sorry to ask mm, another sure. question. No, no, please do. How much would you suggest that they insured initially? I mean, on your drawing, you've got three houses side by side. Would you? Insure for total replacement of each of those houses? Not total replacement, no. So in that situation, um, I probably insure, have insured for the whole of the rebuild of this structure and probably the whole of the rebuild of that one. Okay, Okay, it's quite close here, so you might take 25% of that one. So in reality, what's that going to be? Probably 
1.5, something like that. Well, they go take. back to the three houses there, aren't they? I, th I think where they're terraced, and you've got, I mean, we, we, you've got existing basements here as well, which probably complicates it a bit. Um, but I, I wouldn't go for rebuild on the whole lot because it's unlikely that you'll totally destroy all three of them. Okay. Is that what you call a first loss basis? Yeah. In, re in reality, that's what it is because all liability policies are first loss. They'll pay up to a limit and that's it. Okay. So we're, you're right. We'll look at the rebuild of those three and then we'll look at the works that are going on and say, actually, in reality, what's the worst that could happen here? Okay. So can, can I just briefly on something? So uh, th this project comes to an end <coughs> and then this event happens. Mm -hmm. So what policy should there have been in place to cover you for the latent defect? They, they should have bought a latent defects policy. But in this instance, if the latent defects insurer surveyor had gone along yeah. and had a look at the works that were carried out, they'd have said, I'm sorry, this is, you know, it's not right. Okay, and at that point, they would have actually got really good value out of it, both before and after the works that were finished. Right. Okay. So if they've got building regs on that, would they have been covered by their current policy? They would have to have proved um, that it was an insured loss and not um, and not um, defective workmanship. If, for instance, the workmanship had been fine and there'd been a landslip or something of that sort, and they could reasonably have contended that, then their home insurance would have paid. Okay? Again, a lot of the time it depends who you buy home insurance from. With the advent of things like the aggregators, what insurers have done successively <coughs> over the last 10 years is what's called hollow out their policies. So actually they provided less and less cover <coughs> rather than more and more to make them cheaper because half a percent here or there can make a big difference on compare the market and all that sort of thing. So, so just to sort of simplify it, Jim down the road is doing an extension, he's got his builders in, it's going to be 50 grand, but he does use a JCT contract. His mm -hmm. house is already insured by direct line. Do you say he doesn't use a JCT contract? No, he does. He does, yep. So his house is already insured through direct line or whatever, does he then, then come to you and say, look, I need a, a joint policy to cover the building works, and they run together? No. So what happens uh, in the majority of cases, and, th and this is why um, I'll, I'll come on to the cost estimator in a minute, but this is one of the reasons we'd like you guys to use it, is that they'll ring up direct line. You know, somebody will say to them, one of their professionals will say to them, um, right, it's Wednesday today, you've got contractors coming in, in Monday, on Monday, better ring up direct line, let them know what's going on. Direct line, get the call, and they say, actually, we're coming off cover. We're not interested. You know, we don't insure properties undergoing works. Okay? And at that point, the balloon goes up, and we end up scrabbling something together quite quickly. Okay? <laughs> the, re the reason they don't do it is for all the reasons I was talking about earlier. But all their cost models, and bear in mind all of these organisations are run by phenomenally good accountants with all sorts of algorithms, they don't want to get involved in the catastrophe losses that we get involved in. Okay? We don't get lots of small losses. They tend to be massive and few and far between. Okay? So at that point, they cancel their insurance, their buildings insurance with direct line. They instigate some insurance, which is a renovation product with a provider okay, that covers joint names. That's on for the currency of the contract until practical completion, at which point then they ring up direct line and away they go again. Right. Okay? Presuming that the work has been um, signed off um, by building regs and whoever's helping them administer the contract as having been undertaken properly, then subsequently, should something happen, let's say a little bit of ground movement, then the insurers will come in they will deal with the claim as a ground movement claim, but they may look dependent on the contract that you've signed with the contractor to subrogate against them. Right. Okay. If they've been signed off by building control, would they have sort of better chance? Much better chance, yep. Much, much better chance. Um, personally, I think if that had been signed off by building control, uh, actually they would have got away with landslip or something like that, which is an insured peril under the policy. But because it hadn't been, the insurers just turned it away. Would building control sign it off? I, d I don't think they'd have signed that off, no. Yeah. 
Number two. Not even close. <laughs> I've got one at the moment. Sorry to make all the room. No, no. It's a, it's a piling job in, yep. in Swansea on a headland where there are, it's, it's infamous for limestone fishes. Mm -hmm. And uh, my my appointing owner is the building owner carrying out the extension, piling along the boundary. The footings are next door, we believe to be shallow, low, and inadequate anyway. Because the cracks in turn, even when we did our shadow condition. Yep. I suggested the JCT 21.2.1, mm -hmm. which he took out. Roger Bullemont came in, designed the piling, installed five piles next door, starts falling into a uh, slight sinkhole, etc. Yeah. Problem escalates. Um, at the moment, uh, Bullemont are suggesting that it's non-negligent and they're not responsible because they have uh, they would have recommended the same had it been in a property down the road. They've done 17 of these on the headland in Swansea over the last 24 years with success. So why would they be negligent? And that and that's where the argument is about to escalate. Now. I think they've got a point, to be yeah. fair, yeah. because, because well, could, could they have reasonably expected yeah, what was there? Yeah. Was presumably there's some sort of ground survey as well, is there? Yeah, microgravity survey, it costs, it costs 15 grand to have. Right. It's like a sonar uh, type. Yeah. And that didn't liberate? Would that be reasonable to have that done? I don't know. So you didn't have that done? No, you didn't have that done. No one had that done. Right. Because of the cost. Okay. Prohibitive. Prohibitive. Okay. So, actually, so is a, a normal ground condition survey undertaken? Uh, just a, a, a dig. Just, right. Just a dig, yeah. Right. And what, three feet or? <laughs> yeah, something like that. Right, okay. okay. I'm the party wall survey. I'm not, I wasn't involved in the project itself. So okay. It's, it's all about the kick off. So, on the basis that they've done a load more in that area, could they reasonably ex have expected this to happen? Well, yes, that's what I think. You think they could? Yeah, I think so. But I mean, was there enough done up front to you know, try and eliminate that? I'm not sure. I'm not sure how far you would there, go. There, yeah. there becomes a point, doesn't there, with, um, yeah. with these situations where how far do you go to actually ensure <coughs> that... Yeah. And, it, and is that in the context of the job uneconomic? Yes, it would have been in this instance. Yeah. Okay. So actually, I think they've got a point and I think non-neg might well pay. Mm. Do you know the non neg policies with? Yeah, national uh, NFU. NFU have written non neg. <laughs> mm, that'll be written with somebody else, but yeah. I, I suspect. But uh, it'll be interesting to see how that goes on. So, what uh, we've got is a portal which professionals can use <laughs> to actually estimate the cost of this insurance because, as I said, most clients come to it very, very late in the process. Nobody's actually told them that they might need to buy additional insurance, and so they get awfully hot under the collar, both with us and with you, um, because they've already spent all their money and probably more on the project. Okay? So, we put um, a quick quote calculator in, uh, which we'll send a link to JJ, uh, so you can uh, get to it, um, which just for a few pieces of information, enables you to actually get an estimate of what the contract's going to cost to insure, excluding non-neg, which is really specialist underwriting stuff, okay? Um, I asked one of our guys just to have a look and see how long it would actually take to do. Had you got all the information? So it's a 12-month project, million-pound existing structure, it's grade two listed, it's in an urban area. Standard construction, so brick and tile, brick and slate. 650,000 contract, there isn't any own plant owned by the client, and we're not retaining any contents of the premises. Five million pound limit indemnity, and you know, within a few seconds, you've got an indication that you, you can put in a provisional sum for, okay, and actually um, your client's then expecting rather than not expecting, okay. Do you have the right to use that catty tune, man? <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not. Are you sure? Definitely not, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm sure they'd be really upset. So, um, on our website, there's a knowledge base where you can look at some of these issues. Um, there's a section specifically for architects and another one for renovators um, where we talk some of this stuff through. Okay. 
Uh, our guys are usually on hand to talk to you about issues and problems. Um, there isn't much we haven't seen, so we're about the only people who underwrite thatch. Um, I've done conversions of water towers, um, a canal tunnel, I was somebody who lived in a canal tunnel, but you know, all, all sorts of weird things, okay? Um, but we love to get involved in really interesting projects. Uh, there's also, um, for those of you who are having problems um, explaining to your client um, why this type of insurance is more expensive, uh, a YouTube channel um, where the videos are sort of between one and three minutes, just talking about some of the issues. Some clients are more receptive to that, to that than others. Um, I'll play you a quick one now if we've got time, um, which is about why this class of business is more expensive. Occasionally, during a property refurbishment, the project goes wrong. Maybe the contractors are negligent or don't take enough care. And the next thing you know, a fire starts and your property is damaged. At this point, you're either eternally grateful that you took out that renovation insurance policy, or you're staring disbelievingly at the loss adjuster as he tells you you're not covered. How will you meet the additional costs of fixing the damage? If you don't take out the proper renovation project insurance, how long will you beat yourself up after the incident? It could take you years to pay off any uninsured losses. Renovation insurance is there to give you peace of mind when disasters occur. During a construction project, the risk to your property is higher. The bad news is, your standard policy often won't cover those risks. Please don't take a chance. Get specific advice and specialist cover with a renovation insurance policy. Here are some of the risks that will not be covered by your standard buildings insurance. Contractors using welding gear and heat lamps raise the risk of fires. Will their insurance cover this if they burn your house down? There will be times when you need to leave the roof open, exposing your property to the elements. A storm could cause serious damage. Your building will be empty for periods of time during your renovation, especially at weekends and overnight, which provides ample opportunity for vandalism and theft. You'll have valuable building materials stored on your site, and these will be very attractive to thieves. Some refurbishments require structural changes to the building, which can make the property physically unstable for a while. Even near the end of a project, the heating may not be working. You run the risk of burst pipes and water damage when nobody's there. All of these things can damage your property. But what about the people? A building site is a dangerous place. Contractors and visitors can suffer accidental injuries, even death. In a world of no win, no fee injury claims, is that a legal action you want to pay for? You're wiser to spend a few pounds now rather than thousands of pounds in court and settlement fees. You now understand that since the risk is higher, it's reasonable that the premiums will be higher than ordinary household insurance. Renovation insurance understands your risks and accepts them. Buy right or pay twice. There are lots of other ones in there about why you'd want a JCT, how JCT interacts with insurance and that sort of thing. And sometimes, you know, you've got clients who just won't read an email or a couple of sides of A4, and they're actually quite useful for that. So by all means, send them links to those if that helps you. I often um, look for uh, just a few words to explain uh, what we do and uh, why we do what we do and the way we do it. And, um, I used to use something uh, by uh, a Victorian philanthropist and entrepreneur, but it's a lot more long-winded than this, and that sort of says it all. Actually, this is one of these markets where you do get what you pay for, whether you're buying latent defects, non-neg. You know, we, we do an awful lot with Royal Sun Alliance because they are really good at paying claims. Um, so choose your insurers carefully. Make sure you get your contracts right, okay? Make sure you do it in joint names because the client wins, all right? And make sure that they go to a broker they trust. You know, it, it may, uh, about 60% of the UK market comes into us anyway because we back people like Hiscox. So um, we see a lot of this sort of stuff all day, every day. But 
actually when clients win is when this is done right. Okay. Thanks so much for your time today. It's, uh, it's been nice.